My name's Brandon and this is Cartoon Network Video Game History, a show where I take a look back on all of the video games based on Cartoon Network shows and retrospectively review them. Alright, I promise this is the last mobile game I'll be reviewing. The Steven Universe Light Trilogy is something rare for Cartoon Network games, and licensed games in general. Developer Grumpy Face set out to make a genuine series of games, each building off the framework of the last and telling an overall story. Cartoon Network is no stranger to having one developer make multiple games for one show. You can look to Ben 10 or even Powerpuff Girls for that. But there wasn't much method behind it. Attack the Light was a sleeper hit, and Save the Light proved that Grumpy Face were all in on giving Steven Universe the treatment it deserves. The final game in the trilogy, Unleash the Light, was released on November 27, 2019 exclusively for Apple devices. Not only was the game exclusive to Apple, but it was also exclusively available as part of Apple Arcade. If you're not aware, and I wouldn't blame you if you aren't, Apple Arcade was an initiative slash service launched last year to try and give mobile gaming a bit of maturity. It's a subscription service you pay for monthly that gives you access to a load of games, many of which are full-fledged titles. It's essentially Netflix for mobile games or a mobile version of Xbox's Game Pass. The weirdness of Unleash the Light's release doesn't end there though. Not only is it only available on Apple Arcade, but from what I can tell, the game was shadow released. A shadow release is when something releases out of nowhere with no warning. It's generally something only employed by musicians when releasing an album, but due to the current global state, we've seen movies and games doing it way more often. From my research, I couldn't find a single mention of this game prior to it being announced that it was out. I'm 99% sure nobody outside of Cartoon Network, Grumpy Face or Apple even knew this game existed before it came out. Personally, I think this method of release backfired massively. Anecdotally, I had heard of both of the first games due to their marketing efforts, particularly Save the Light, which had a lot of buzz leading up to release. However, despite running a YouTube channel dedicated to reviewing Cartoon Network games, the release of this game completely slipped by me. It wasn't until 6 months after release that I learned of its existence. I think having the game be exclusive to Apple Arcade while releasing out of nowhere was a bad combination. There was clearly no marketing put into this game, so basically you needed to be an existing subscriber to Apple Arcade or a hardcore Steven Universe fan to know about it. Shadow drops can be extremely cool and an effective way to drum up excitement, but this seems to have gone horribly wrong for Unleash the Light. Further supporting my theory that the release massively screwed over the game, there isn't a single review for this on Metacritic. Heading to Google, I only managed to pull up two reviews for it. In fact, searching for Steven Universe Unleash the Light review on Google pulls up far more results for Save the Light than the game I'm actually searching for. From the reviews I found, one site gave the game an 8 out of 10, while Touch Arcade gave it 5 stars, which I'm assuming is out of 5. Steven Universe Unleash the Light seems to be yet another case of a very poorly promoted Cartoon Network game. However, that's not what's important here. For us, it's all about whether it's good or not. Before I dissect the final game in the Light trilogy, make sure you're subscribed. Next week is the finale of Cartoon Network video game history. Well, I say finale, but I'll be returning to this series every time a new Cartoon Network game is released, like Ben 10 Power Trip in October. I'll be closing out with a bang by finally reviewing Dexter's Laboratory Mandark Slab. You guys can finally stop with the comments. Although I'll still have to put up with those Teen Titans comments. To make sure you catch that review and the launch of Nickelodeon video game history, make sure you're subscribed. But now, on with the review. Hello, giant face. It's always a promising sign when you do research on a game like this and find out that the developer is still supporting it 6 months later. And it's not just for bug fixes and performance updates either. Grumpy Face launched a significant content update in May of this year. God, Grumpy Face are just so clearly the best and most dedicated developer Cartoon Network has ever had. Cybernetic Brandon from the future here. In between recording my voiceover and editing this video, Grumpy Face released another update. This time adding Peridot as a playable character. I think it's also worth mentioning that, despite being a mobile game, Steven Universe Unleash the Light can be played with a controller. When Apple Arcade was revealed, Apple basically admitted that touch controls are a dog shit way to play 90% of games, so there was spruiking controller compatibility with most Apple Arcade games. This was intriguing to me, so I played basically the entirety of Unleash the Light with a DualShock 4. I'll get into my specific thoughts on how that works later, but I thought the controller compatibility was something worth mentioning up front. 
especially because I was complaining about touch controls in my Phantom Fable review. So, another entry into the Steven Universe light series, and another collaboration with Rebecca Sugar for the story. I've said it like a million times, but it is so refreshing to see a show's creator caring about video games based on the show. The new wave of Cartoon Network show creators like Sugar and Ian Jones Cordy are clearly very inspired by video games, and even Gendy Tartakovsky seemed more involved with Battle Through Time compared to the older Samurai Jack games. It's great to see. Unleash the Light pretty explicitly takes place in between the end of Season 5 and Steven Universe the movie. The other two games can mostly be played without major spoilers if you weren't completely caught up, other than Lapis and Peridot turning good being spoiled. However, it's a good idea to have watched through Season 5 before playing this. While it's not directly continuing on the events of the show, Unleash the Light does a lot to flesh out the state of the universe in the aftermath of the big changes in that fifth season. More importantly, it's directly continuing plot threads from the first two Light games. It's a nice balance between touching on what's happening in a show, while also still being its own thing. Unfortunately, Unleash the Light isn't a great place to start if you haven't played the first two games. Narratively, you'll be completely lost with 90% of what's going on. I guess that's the unfortunate reality of being the third game in a series. A brief overview of the story is that after Steven removes the diamonds from their dictatorship, two new gems, Demantoid and Pyrope, see this void of power as an opportunity to seize absolute control. They're attempting to do this by utilizing two prisms, so naturally, Steven's prism enemy turned friend from the first two games is along for the ride. Unsurprisingly, I really dug the story. I'm sounding like a broken record at this point, but I love how important these stories feel. They're not crucial to understanding the show, but they beautifully flesh out the world. The idea that a couple of gems would see this massive shakeup of power and want to step into the role of gem overlords just seems like such a no-brainer, and I'm glad it got to be told. Once again, dialogue is heavily voice acted. All of the important story moments feature full voice acting for every character. The gameplay for Unleash the Light is where things get very interesting. The first game in the series was a mobile title, while the sequel was a console game that could do so much more because it wasn't restrained by its platform. Naturally, I was really curious about what would happen now that we're going back to mobile. Would the game completely regress? Would it just be Attack the Light with a fresh coat of paint? The answer lies somewhere in the middle. Unleash the Light feels like the missing bridge between the first two games. It was such a dramatic jump between attack and save, it really feels like this game, from a mechanic standpoint, should have been released in the middle. It's not quite the out and out mobile title that Attack the Light is, but it certainly isn't the console game that Save the Light is. Firstly, the movement from the first game is back. To get around environments, you'll be swiping from screen to screen, or flicking the analog stick if using a controller. It's simple, but it works. Because of this, the way you encounter enemies is the same as Attack the Light 2. Gorn is the ability to run around and specifically engage or steer clear of enemies, you have no choice about whether or not you're going to battle. Honestly, basically all of the movement and navigation controls are identical to the first game. How does this work with the controller though? Not very well, to be quite frank. I hate using my phone as a controller. Phones are clearly not meant to be held like a controller, and it just ends up being painful and clunky. Using a controller seemed like a natural choice, now that the option was available, and surely the experience would be perfect, seeing as the last game they made was entirely controller-based. Well, it was to my surprise that using a controller in the overworld was extremely frustrating. Moving screen to screen is easy, but picking up items or interacting with things is too clunky. The analog controls are so imprecise. Almost every time I tried to pick up an item or smash a pot, my party ended up running to a different screen. This isn't the biggest issue, I guess, but it's annoying to just want to pick up a new item, only to see Steven sprint off into battle. Visually, it's a massive step up from Attack the Light. It's obviously not as ambitious in scope when it comes to environments and stuff that Save the Light offered, but I think this game is rather beautiful. Everything is way more fleshed out and detailed than the first mobile game, and it's got that awesome vibrant colour palette here that makes every level pop. One of the first major additions you'll notice outside of battle is the ability to unlock new costumes. In Save the Light, you'd find weapon schematics, and by collecting the correct coloured items, you could upgrade your weapons. The same system exists here, except this time it's for costumes. While there is the obvious cosmetic benefit to these, with each costume being a direct reference to the show, there are battle bonuses of each outfit. For example, when Steven unlocks his Varsity Jacket outfit, you gain the ability to use two items in a turn once per battle. This is a neat little substitution for weapon upgrades, but the best part is that you can mix and match the effects with the visual style. This is something seen in big MMOs like Destiny, where you can gain the stat and ability benefits of a certain item, but still keep the visual aesthetic of another. Great thinking from Grumpy Face to include this. Side quests also make a return here, but they're somehow even more basic than what was in Save the Light. 
All of them are pretty much some variation of kill X amount of enemies or find X amount of items. What you'll be mostly focusing on while running through levels, other than battling monsters and getting to the end, is finding rainbow keys. These rainbow keys are used to unlock doors at the Palace of Light, the home base of Demantoid and Pyrope, and the location that this entire game centers around. What about the combat? Save the Light was both similar to Attack the Light, and also radically different. Well, much like basically everything in this game, it's a half step between the first and second games. Unleash the Light returns to the strict turn-based battles we saw in the first game, rather than the real-time battling in Save the Light. Seeing this was pretty disappointing. There's nothing wrong with the turn-based gameplay per se, but after having experienced the last game's battles, it's hard to not be a little upset. We've also lost Connie and Greg in the transition back to mobiles. Thankfully, they're replaced by Lapis and Bismuth, two characters who had never been playable previously. As you can imagine, all of the returning characters have had their movesets and abilities updated, while old reliables such as Pearl's Spear Throw return. I think a great quality of life addition here would have been an optional tutorial. The basic gameplay functions almost identically to the past two games, so having to sit through a tutorial for it yet again is frustrating for seasoned players. It was just explaining stuff I already knew, and I actually found that they didn't explain most of the new stuff in the game and left it up to the player to figure it out. A version of the teamwork bars that appeared in Save the Light Return, but much more simplified. Previously, every character had a specific relationship with every other character. Once filled through in-battle actions and dialogue choices, you'd unlock the potential to use three new attacks or abilities. This opened up so many possibilities and there was a ridiculous amount of content that really added to the depth and strategy of the game. A teamwork bar is present in Unleash the Light, which is built up through perfect attacks and blocks, but it's just one bar for the entire team. New abilities for this bar are unlocked through leveling up specific characters, but much of the depth has been lost. This bar is how fusion is achieved again, but there has been a small tweak to its functionality. Fusions now only last 3 turns. You can imagine this came as a big shock to me after having played the other games in this series, which didn't work like this. The game never explains this to you. This is why I take issue with their tutorial. They're happy to re-explain things that haven't changed, but hide the mechanics that have changed. This majorly fucked me over the first time I fused. I fused at the end of my turn when I had no star points left, meaning I was completely wasting one turn of fusion availability. How was I supposed to know this mechanic had changed all of a sudden? If you watched my Save the Light review, you'll know how much I praised and gushed over the way placement on the battlefield changed from battle to battle. Not only did the initial formations vary, but various attacks would change how everything was set up. A lot of that has been lost here, for example, you can no longer defeat an enemy by hitting them so hard they fall off a cliff, but once again this game proves to be that Light Trilogy missing link. Grumpy Face actually introduced one of the things on my wishlist. The new formation button allows you to change where two of your party members are standing per turn. This allows you to line up attacks better and adds in new layers of depth to battles. It also means characters like Pearl, who have major attacks that are best used when lining up multiple enemies, don't sit unused purely because they ended up in a poor position. It's not as good as Save the Light, but I still appreciated it. In particular, I loved using it with Lapis. She has a tidal wave attack that can damage multiple enemies if they're in a line, but once upgraded, the move can actually heal party members if the wave passes through them. For such a simple game, Grumpy Face keep finding ways to make it deeper than it appears on the surface. Additionally, moving a character closer to the enemies makes you more prone to attacks, while moving them to the back makes them less likely to be attacked. Again, lots of depth to battles because of this. Badges and the skill tree stuff return once again, but they've brought a new addition with them, charms. Charms are basically the exact same thing as badges, they upgrade specific stats when equipped. You can put up to three of these on a character, and the way Grumpy Face tries to differentiate this from badges is by making them exclusive to specific characters. However, in previous games, badges had the exact same caveat. So yeah, charms are just badges with a different name. The Unleash the Light experience sounds like a mostly pleasant one so far, but from here on out is where things take a slight turn for the worse. I've already mentioned the poor analog stick controls in the overworld, which were a pain but didn't majorly affect things. When it comes to the battling, it does have a major effect. The conclusion I've come to is that Unleash the Light is not meant to be played with a controller. Just don't do it. It's all fun and games until the janky stick controls forces you to end your attacking turn without even making a single move. This happened way too frequently. For moves that require aiming, like Pearl Spear or one of Rainbow Quartz's attacks, using the stick is nightmarish. And in general, trying to select different options is a pain. This could have been easily solved by allowing the player to use the D-pad in these situations, but the game picks and chooses when you're allowed to use it. 
So yeah, my recommendation is to not play this game with a controller. Pretty wild that it feels this bad when they had just made a console game where the controls weren't nearly this bad. Another bizarre occurrence was that I experienced way more glitches than I did with Save the Light, a game infamous for how buggy it was. There were times where I was completely stuck and couldn't move around the overworld, and the game completely froze while loading. There are heaps of little annoying bugs that make doing basic things like going in and out of menus a pain. I had to exit the game and completely kill the app far too many times than is acceptable. While I love Grumpy Face as a developer, it's clear they have some issues with getting their games to run smoothly. Those are just my minor grievances though. There are some much larger ones to come. Firstly, why the hell did they feel the need to bring back the ambush mechanic? It's just god awful. If you're unaware, at certain times in this game you'll come to a screen where you're ambushed, meaning the enemy gets to attack first. This isn't too bad when used as a set encounter, it actually breaks up the standard gameplay nicely. Where it does become a huge drag is when you get them randomly while backtracking and trying to discover everything a level has to offer. There are so many secrets and little nooks to discover here, but it starts to become really annoying when you're penalised with all these ambush encounters. It de-incentivizes exploration. It's at its absolute worst towards the end of the game when you're going through the Palace of Light. That place is a labyrinth, so naturally you're backtracking a lot as you try and get your bearings. Even just including the ability to run from battles would have been nice. I'm not sure why Grumpy Face was so against including this mechanic in any of their games. The Palace of Light in general is also one of my biggest gripes. It genuinely killed my enjoyment. As I said, the Palace of Light is a labyrinth, with the game giving you no hints whatsoever about where to go. Even if you're an expert and know exactly where to go, this final area will take you almost two hours. Seriously, go watch a complete walkthrough and you'll see how long it takes to traverse the Palace of Light and beat the final boss. Now, think about how long it'll take the average person to get through when they have no idea where they're going. To me, it genuinely felt like my time in the Palace of Light was longer than all of the other parts of the game combined. It's just really strange pacing. I've made my thoughts known on Labyrinth style levels previously, so it shouldn't be too shocking that I didn't enjoy this. However, it's been made even worse because you're stopped every 5 seconds. Trying to figure out where you're supposed to go is an arduous slog because of this. The Palace of Light is just a ball of garbage. I hate everything about this concept. It is ridiculously boring from a design standpoint to me, and felt like I was just wandering around a big boring palace with nothing interesting to see. The balance of the game also feels like it falls out of whack towards the end. There are so many battles and so many level up items that you become massively overpowered. The teamwork bar also lights up ridiculously fast. It was getting to the point where I was fusing to Sunstone every battle. If I chose to use something simpler like the healing ability, I found that I could fill up the bar multiple times per battle. The game ends up devolving into something that is extremely boring and repetitive. It flips from being fun to tedious. It also doesn't help that there's only a handful of unique enemy types. This made every battle in the palace feel identical. I wish it didn't, but the Palace of Light genuinely ruined Unleash the Light for me. This experience distinctly reminds me of how I felt playing the Subspace Emissary in Super Smash Bros Brawl. I was enjoying all the cool crossover cutscenes, but then the finale is the Great Maze, a tedious labyrinth. I tried for an agonizingly long time, but that level was so god awful I never even finished the game. Because of this and the ridiculous length, the game ends up overstaying its welcome. So, you must be Demantoid. You are Steven. Before my run-in with the Palace of Light, Unleash the Light was the clear number two in the Steven Universe Light trilogy. It felt like such a strange game to play, because it bridges the gap between the first mobile game and the console game, yet it was the last game released. Quite funny to look back on it from that perspective. However, after playing through the Palace of Light, I'd have to put it in last place. It's still a solid game, and amazing compared to Cartoon Network standards, but falls down in too many key areas. Unleash the Light drags on for far too long considering it has less unique content and variety than Save the Light. To beat Save the Light, you'll put in about 9 hours, while this game takes you like 12. I certainly could have done with an extra 4 hours of Save the Light, but this game should have been 4 hours shorter. Additionally, all of the missing features from the previous game did hurt my experience. If this was the second game in this series, my overall reception would have been more positive. 
all in all, even though I'm disappointed because of the ending and the steps back it takes, I still mostly enjoyed my time. These Steven Universe RPGs from Grumpy Face are just so damn good. The combination of gameplay, visuals, music and narrative are basically perfect for a cartoon video game. It'll be quite interesting to see where Grumpy Face goes after this. They've essentially reinvented themselves as the Steven Universe developer, but now that the show is finished, where do they go? Perhaps they could do one last game? Personally, I think the best decision would be for Cartoon Network to partner with Grumpy Face to develop a game for one of their newer series. They're desperately trying to fill three regular show, Adventure Time, and Steven Universe shaped holes, so why not get a proven developer to work on something for Craig of the Creek or Victor and Valentino? Next week is the final episode of Cartoon Network video game history for the time being. I'll finally be looking at Dexter's laboratory, Mandark's Lab. Will it send the series out with a bang, or will this be yet another flop from Cartoon Network's early days? Make sure you subscribe to find out.